Before he was America's first documented serial killer, he was simply Herman Webster Mudgett. Born in the year of 1861 in the quiet state of New Hampshire, Mudgett was a child of peculiar interests. His intelligence was undeniable, a trait that often set him apart from his peers. But it was his fascination with medicine that truly marked the inception of his dark journey. As a young man, he found an uncanny thrill in delving into the mysteries of life and death. He'd often be seen engrossed in the study of human anatomy, a passion that was as intriguing as it was unsettling. His curiosity, however, didn't stop at mere learning. Mudgett's manipulative charm and cunning intellect led him down a path of deception and fraudulence. These initial exploits, while seemingly insignificant, were but the first steps in his transformation into a monster. Little did the world know, this seemingly unassuming man would become one of the most notorious figures in American crime history. In 1886, Herman Webster Mudgett adopted a new name, Dr. Henry Howard Holmes. This was more than just a change of identity. It marked a chilling transformation, a metamorphosis into one of America's most notorious serial killers. Holmes moved to the bustling city of Chicago, a place ripe with opportunity and anonymity for a man with his dark intentions. Here he acquired a pharmacy, stepping into the role of a trusted community figure. But behind this veneer of respectability, Holmes was far from the benevolent pharmacist he presented himself to be. Under his new alias, Holmes began his criminal activities. His pharmacy became the front for his illicit operations. He would swindle, cheat, and deceive all with an unsettling charm that disarmed his victims and lulled them into a false sense of security. But the pharmacy was only the beginning of Holmes's dark journey. In the late 1880s Holmes began construction of a building that would later be known as the Murder Castle. The Murder Castle was no ordinary dwelling. It was a three-story block-long building located in the Englewood neighborhood of Chicago. Holmes had the structure designed to his unique specifications, which were as confounding as they were chilling. The layout was a labyrinth, filled with stairways to nowhere, doorways opening to brick walls, and hallways twisting back on themselves. As peculiar as the building's design was, Holmes's behavior during its construction was equally suspicious. He constantly hired and fired different workers, ensuring no one but him fully understood the building's bizarre blueprint. This air of secrecy extended to the local suppliers too, with Holmes frequently changing where he purchased his materials, making it difficult to track his activities. But the real horror of the murder castle lay within its walls. Numerous rooms were soundproofed and fitted with gas lines allowing Holmes to asphyxiate his victims at his leisure. Some rooms were lined with iron plates and had blowtorches fitted into the walls, while others concealed chutes that led directly to the basement. The basement itself was a macabre workshop, equipped with a dissecting table, a crematory and a large kiln. Holmes would use these to dispose of his victims' bodies often selling the skeletons to medical schools. The murder castle was more than just a building, it was a testament to the twisted mind of H. H. Holmes, a physical embodiment of his sadistic desires. Each room, each secret passage, each trapdoor was meticulously designed for a singular, grim purpose, murder. It was in this house of horrors that Holmes would commit unspeakable acts. Holmes's reign of terror had begun. His victims, both confirmed and suspected, were as varied as they were numerous. His method of killing was as chilling as the man himself, and his method of disposing of the bodies was a horrifying testament to his cunning and cruelty. Among his confirmed victims were Julia and Pearl Connor, a mother and daughter who disappeared after spending the Christmas of 1885 at the murder castle, then there was Emmeline Sigrand, a beautiful and naive young woman who had the misfortune of accepting employment at Holmes's pharmacy. The list of suspected victims is even longer. It includes numerous guests of the murder castle whose disappearances went unnoticed in the hustle and bustle of the World's Fair. There were also several business associates who vanished under mysterious circumstances, and even a few of Holmes's wives are thought to have met their end at his hands. Holmes's method of killing was chillingly methodical. He would lure his victims into his labyrinthine hotel, where he had designed rooms specifically for the purpose of murder. These included a gas chamber, a dissection room, and even a crematorium where he could dispose of the bodies without leaving a trace. But Holmes's crimes weren't limited to murder. He was also a con artist of the highest order, and he had a particular fondness for insurance fraud. He would take out policies on his victims then fake their deaths or simply kill them to collect the payout. Despite the gruesome nature of his crimes, Holmes managed to evade suspicion for years. 
but even the craftiest criminals make mistakes. And H. H. Holmes was no exception. His descent into the hands of justice was not sparked by his heinous murders, but rather by a more mundane crime, insurance fraud. Holmes had concocted a scheme with an accomplice, Benjamin Patesel, wherein Patesel would fake his own death, allowing his life insurance to be claimed. However Holmes, ever the cold-blooded opportunist, decided to kill Patesel for real, and claim the insurance money himself. It was this act of deceit that finally raised the suspicions of the insurance company, leading to Holmes's capture. Upon his arrest in Boston in November 1894, the authorities were expecting a simple case of insurance fraud. Little did they know, they had in their custody America's first serial killer. The trial that ensued would reveal a horror story that sent shockwaves across the nation. As the trial unfolded, the extent of Holmes's crimes came to light. With each passing day, more and more gruesome details were uncovered painting a chilling picture of the man behind the murder castle. The courtroom was abuzz with whispers and gasps of disbelief as tales of his sadistic killings were laid bare. In the face of such overwhelming evidence, Holmes's fate was sealed. He was found guilty and sentenced to death. But even then he remained an enigma, showing no remorse for his actions. Instead he seemed to revel in the attention, going as far as confessing to 27 murders, although only nine could be conclusively proven. In 1896, Holmes was hanged for his crimes, bringing an end to his reign of terror. But the legacy of his atrocities would live on, forever etching his name in the annals of American crime history. More than a century later, the story of H. H. Holmes still sends chills down our spines. The man, the myth, the monster, his legacy lives on in a morbid fascination that refuses to fade. The name H. H. Holmes has become synonymous with the very concept of the serial killer, a term that didn't even exist during his lifetime. His dark deeds have inspired countless books, films, and even an episode of a popular television series. These adaptations have often taken liberties with the facts, adding layers of myth to an already chilling reality. In the heart of Chicago where Holmes's infamous murder castle once stood, there is now a post office. Yet the memory of the castle and its horrors persist. Urban legends tell of ghostly apparitions and strange happenings, a testament to the enduring power of the Holmes narrative. Theories about Holmes are as numerous as they are varied. Some believe that he faked his own death, living out his days in obscurity. Others suggest that he may have been the notorious Jack the Ripper, a theory that while largely discredited speaks volumes about the enduring fascination with this man and his crimes. But perhaps the most powerful aspect of Holmes's legacy is the cautionary tale he provides. His case is a stark reminder of the danger that can lie behind a charming smile, the evil that can lurk beneath the surface of a seemingly ordinary man. His story serves as a warning, a dark testament to the depths of human depravity. Holmes's legacy is not just one of murder and mayhem, but one that serves as a mirror to our own darkest fears. It is a reflection of our fascination with the macabre, our desire to understand the incomprehensible, to make sense of the senseless. As we delve into the darkness of the past, we are reminded of the capacity for evil that can lurk beneath the most ordinary of facades.